Good afternoon, Sivirkam. I'm back. So this time a completely different register, no more an inspirational presentation. And now we will go into more technical stuff. So I'm sure that you are aware of Journey, which is a video game, which is about uh, one of these journeys that we all do, okay? When we start, when we engage in something, it's an initiatory journey. I am Javier Tallon, co-founder and chief operation officer at JTSEC. I had to set up my own company to end up working in cybersecurity. And this means that now I lead and work with a team of people. Um, we do cybersecurity from Granada. Uh, well, we said before that you can do cybersecurity from anywhere. We test manufacturers' products. We check the security, we try to hack the products, and if things go well, often there is, um, well, they can certify it, they can uh, stamp it, and if not, well, they, we, they keep on trying it up until they can certify it. So we work with uh, norms, common criteria, FIP 142, so this is what we mentioned this morning, this orange book from the Department of Defense of the US, this evolved into common criteria, that is to say methodology to, uh, for product testing, which is uh, criteria that are used by uh, US and as well as very many other countries. We also have other testing for products for ICT products, so it is the cryptological, National Cryptologic Center recommends the length communication to all the, well, that all the products undergo or fulfill the length certification. So, disclaimer. This is an analysis that we did from a cyber security product of the Internet of the Things. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot disclose the type of the actual type of product, but still, we can show you photographs of the inside the product, internal photographs of the products, and then we also did testing with no norms. We just wanted to check the level of security of the product. The manufacturer wanted to see whether his product was robust or secure enough. And then an uh, important element is that this product has to be uh, resistant or to physical uh, elements. When I'm saying bare metal hardware hacking, what do I mean by that? Hardware hacking, I'm sure that many of you are aware of it. This is a hacking of Internet of the Things product. But when we are talking about a bare metal environment, we are referring to an environment where there is no OS, where the app is run right away on silicon. Uh, what are the differences that we find when we do inverse engineering? Often we do inverse engineering as a part of the process, a process of looking for vulnerabilities and checking and ensuring that the product we are analyzing is secure. And what we found here? Well, in this case, there are no symbols. So symbols help you see where you are when you are doing reverse engineering. So we found no symbols. There were no file systems at all either. There is no directory to look for things or to store things. And then we were at a situation of zero knowledge. The manufacturer brought his product to us and then, well, asked us to just uh, to analyze it. And this is what I will go through. So these are the different stages that we follow.
So, first of all, we analyze the device, its architecture, then we ac going access to the code, then we could see reading protection, we bypass them, then we did We've reversed the code that we uh, extracted. Then we did debugging and then fast testing. And then we could see the uh, characteristic of exploitation of this product and what could we do to trojanize this product. How did it start? So in the beginning we were giving a device, a product, we knew nothing about it. And when you have, when the product has physical access, often manufacturers introduce countermeasures so that uh, when you open the device and try and access the internals, well, the code is automatically deleted. In this case, there was nothing like that at all. Often what you find is the switch. Often the switch are just pressed down and when you open the box then the switches are lifted and it is like pressing a button making all the uh, code to be deleted. There was no anti tamper switch at all. Therefore it was very easy. We just uh, used our Dremel to open it and then went right inside. And what did we find? Well, we found uh, uh, a board such as that one, and then we moved on right away to recognize it. So it had a module for fingerprinting, an LCD display, a contactless infer interface, a contact interface, so that by, uh, well, either to swipe a smart card or to just insert a smart card, a USB interface, and then also two SMA interfaces. Some cards are very similar to SIM cards, but in this case, some cards are used to include or store cryptographic activity, to store keys. It is a very secure place, highly isolated. Well, the former Digital Plus has uh, some cards in it. Okay, this is what we found. And the first striking thing is that there was no external flash, so there is say there were there was no place where we could store anything. So we couldn't say, okay, I connect to this flash, I will hard code it, and I could get access to the code. No, we didn't find that. What we found instead were two microcontrollers from STM32 family. STM32 family. is a manufacturer of microcontrollers of IRM, which you know that it's a trendy architecture uh, that has overtaken Intel. And there were two microcontrollers, one to control application. It was in charge of controlling interaction with LCD, so that is to say user, more of a user application. And then Cortex M3, and then SEC microcontroller STM232 FO72, connected with a fingerprinting module, some interfaces, contactless and contact interfaces, and it kind of looked like it was more into uh, security interactions. And then when you find all this, what do you do? Well, first of all, well, the manufacturer uh, publishes the uh, specification for these microcontrollers. Before, I'd like to clarify something. Difference between a microprocessor and a microcontroller. Mm, microcontrollers often do not have uh, an OS, they have only small capacity, but they do have real-time capabilities. I'm sure that you are all aware of ABR for Arduino, uh, every, very well known, and then um, on the other hand, with micro 
processor where the uh, flash is less uh, secure, less protected, and it also has a bigger capacity, bigger computing capacity and the storage capacity. In the case of microcontroller, everything is all together. In the silicon, you have the flash, the CPU, the ARM, and the AVR Arduino. And we look for our in our data sheet so that to know what we have better understanding of what we have before us. I'll show you the USB later on because actually this is smaller than a 50p uh, coin and many things are written on it, things that you cannot really see at the naked eye, so you really need to uh, read it through a microphone. So we look through the characteristic features of this microcontroller. First thing that we found is that these microcontrollers of this series are well known by everyone, very much uh, used in the maker community and also in the industrial world. And we had this board which is very similar to Arduino because in this case when this was set up by Chinese, okay, so that they it is, can be supported by Arduino and this is the one that the manufacturer gives to developers so that for them to learn how to program it so that they can test the programs etc and last what we have here is in the ST link which is an interface of offered by the manufacturer so that you log on to the device you can program it etc Uh, recognition stage. Once we have our PCB, we know uh, we know more about the device we are analyzing, and then we wanted to learn how to use it and to develop it. But the motherboard that was made by the manufacturer, we just wanted to take a closer look at it and to see how things were interconnected. How did we do that? Well, very easily. We measure the voltage. So if two uh, points are connected and we connect, are connected, and then we check the voltage, it, they beep. And then we check what was connected with what. So that took patience and our uh, USB microscope. The USB microscope is not is less than 20 euros. And then this is what we got. And then this is the flowchart that we did. And these are all the connections that we found. So we could see connection to the outside through the USB, through a fingerprint uh, module, through interfaces of uh, some cards, smart cards, also through LCD. And then inside we have uh, ports, serious ports. Each uh, microprocessor had two or three of them. Here we also identified some connections. We identified that some of the microcontrollers were connected with each other. Another microcontroller was uh, connected with a fingerprint that one also connected with the smart card and with some module. And then also well-known JTAC and SWD interfaces. When you read literature about hardware hacking, Often said that PADs, like a small dots, uh, small dots that have been removed of the connectors, so you can just connect to them, log on to them, and you can gain access to a console. But it is not that easy. Sometimes it is that easy. Sometimes it is not that easy. 
In our case, this, this was not that easy. Um, what did we do to connect to this microcontroller? So we wanted to control to the uh, series port interface to see how the microcontrollers were communicating with the rest of the peripherals and we also wanted to connect to the JTAC and SWD interfaces. In some points there were paths, that is to say direct access to the control. We could populate it, add a connector to it and to easily connect ourselves. But in other instances that was not the case. Connection through the two microcontrollers it was not possible. There was just a pathway underneath the PCB board linking these two elements. So what did we do? Well, we just scratched it. This is a video of how we scratched it. It would have been great for me to do a live demo, but well, that's a bit dangerous. I will surely will burn my fingers. So now we can see. Well, on the other side we have the microcontroller with the serial ports, uh, and we get the same thing on the other corner. Okay, clear now. So we have uh, scratched some of the points that we wanted to intercept. Well, for many of you, this is a big surprise. So you can really scratch the board and then to connect, okay? And some manufacturers feel that if they put a plastic film on top, that would not be possible, but they are wrong. And then what did we do? We just cut the truck. So if you want to do that, you just cut it, then you break the connection. And that if you really want these two microcontrollers to connect with each other, they should connect with each other from the outside through the uh, connecting points that we have created. So this is the cut truck, and then we added these connectors. Do they want them to talk to each other? Okay, we add two jumpers. So if you just don't want that, we just remove the jumpers, we connect the two serial ports, and then we do what it is known as man in the bus. So when you are looking man in the bus on the internet, this is what you get. So this is the new man in the bus attack. Well, in theory, we were ready to sniff all the traffic in between the two controllers. But the initial problem that we found is that we needed to be aware of the connection parameters. That is to say, at what speed they are communicating with each other, uh, well, all the ports, all the pins, all the everything. And what do the hardware hacking manual says? 
well, that there are some devices such as that on the screen, JTAC later, you connect all that and at the end of the day, well, they tell you all that that you want to know. But at the end, that didn't work because these microcontrollers do not communicate with each other at standard speed. Actually, up until 115,200, but this time it was 10 times bigger, like nearly uh, over 900,000 BPS. And how did we know that? Well, what we just connected a logic sniffer, and then it was like a oscilloscope, and it could see all the traffic going through it, the speed of that traffic, and then at the end, we ended up with something like this. Here, we were right in the middle, and then we made all the traffic to go through our device, and then just to see all the communication between the two controllers. This is known as the Shikra, which is just a converter of USB to one of these uh, serial ports. And they, that gave us the speed that we needed. So once we found out about all the traffic, then the study, we started to see what they, each, what, what they were saying to each other. So here we have two colors, yellow and green. So packages, they all start by zero 02, they finish, in, uh, finish by zero 03. CRC, the summation of all the previous bytes, little by little, a process is created, a process that help us understand or get to know, which is the communication protocol used by these two microcontrollers. And obviously, as you can guess, they were not encrypted at all because they, had, they were protected by this plastic film. But we should not forget that our intention was no other but to gain access to the code. That is to say, to download the code of each of the microcontrollers, analyze it, and see uh, what they were doing. After taking a look at the data sheet, we found three different ways to access the code. The first one, JTAG. Who is aware of JTAG? Well, OK, I'll tell you a bit about it. JTAG is just a protocol that manufacturers use to check that everything is well connected. Manufacturers connect to the chip, they have some kind of like tables, and they just put something on top of the board with an interface where everything is connected perfectly all right with each other. They take the interface to the computer, and the computer runs a number of tests saying that everything is properly assembled and the device is ready to be uh, well put into the market. Well, the JTAG, it also allows you to do many other things, such as reading the memory or reading the context of the flash that the microcontroller has inside. Another way to access the code is through SWD, which is exactly the same as JTAG, but in serial manner. So it means that if JTAG has TDI, TDO, TMS, TK, CK, TRST, five threads, SWD has only two, therefore much easier to use because you have to connect less number of devices. And according to the data sheet, a third way to access the code was through a bootloader, loader, which is something that was run before the code and it was inserted there by the manufacturer that would allow you to, uh, to load the code. So JTAG is not on the standard. Well, I didn't say it, but I'm saying that now. But through JTAG, you can take a look at the chips, access the RAM, at CPU logs, and also accessing the flash. I'm saying that it is not a standard. Even though there is a JTAG standard, each manufacturer changes it. So therefore, if you want to do something with that, you buy the uh, device of the manufacturer just to attack his products.
So easiest way to do it through the serial port. We had the connection between the two. We just cut it. We connected ourselves to only one. In this case, the STM 32F103 RET6, which was the bigger one. And the certification, the data sheet tells you that you have to give some electric charge to one of the pins known as boot zero and then connect yourself to the serial uh, port. You force a reset and then when it restarts, you already have it connected to your PC. And then this is what you get. You get a beautiful interface where it uh, tells you all the information about the memory and that you can download. This way you download the content of the micro microcontroller and just a little detail. This is smaller than a 50 cent coin so this pins are very close together connected these four pins this way it's not simple as you can imagine you have to be very patient it's nothing for a demo but it can be done perfect we tried to do the same thing with the other microcontroller and it said access denied what happened well apparently manufacturers do not want you to download the code in the case of the other microprocessor didn't had didn't have protection in place against reading but it was more sensitive and the manufacturer had implemented implemented reading uh, reading protections why because apparently you can have secrets in your microcontroller intellectual property people should not be able to easily download your code so I'll explain how reading protection works. There are two bytes. One is uh, uh, complementary of the other one. There are three security levels, level zero, no protection, anyone can access a flash, download it, upload again, level one, which is read protection. It says no access to flash memory, you cannot download the code, but we, you can access the RAM and you can access the peripherals and then, then there's level 2 which is you can do nothing no debug and it's enabled it's disabled forever once it's level 2 there's no legitimate way to exit level 2 that's something manufacturers don't like because they cannot use the pins to check that everything is okay so apparently they don't like this these two bytes which are complementary and it's like this due to redundancy to have a safer design instead of keeping it in one byte I keep it in two this is kept in non-volatile memory which is a part of a flash memory which in turn is part of the memory map of the system if one byte is 55 and the other one is AA, that's level 0. If it's 33 and CC, that's level 2. And any other combination, it's level 1. When we reach the point at which we said we cannot download this controller's firmware, what do we do? There's a website called Russian uh, research and some very nice people from Russia offer that you send them your microcontroller and for a price they return the code to you and that's it about 2000 euro so we looked for our specific microprocessor and it was on their website and we said okay if they can why can't we Truth to be told, we were very lucky because a month before doing this work, some researchers in cybersecurity from Hoover Institute published a paper in which they were attacking the same family of products we were working with. So we uh, we were lucky. 
they described three attacks to this microcontroller family. One, the first one, the simplest one, which is code boot stepping. It's used to bypass read protections in this type of environment. It says if in your security level you can read RAM and when you start up your code is going to carry out a CRC of everything to verify the integrity that means all the bytes are going to go through your RAM so if they're going to go through your RAM you can read them little by little in our case we didn't have this CRC so we had to use one of the other two exploits described in this paper. First one, security downgrade. Those of you who are older, like myself, you'll remember this type of microcontroller, that's an EEPROM. Now we usually have EEPROM. This is a program memory that can be erased. There was a little window, it was exposed to UV light and the content was erased, the content of flash memory. Now we have EEPROM, which is the same thing, but besides it can be erased electrically. You connect it to your PC and you say, please erase yourself and it's erased. And if we remember the two bytes design with the three values of security. What do these people do? When you're in level one, sorry, when you're in level two or zero, you just need to change one byte to go back to level one. In level one, well, you can do more things. How can we exit level two? We need to find a way to alter one byte, something in these two bytes. And, as I said, this is erased when we apply UV light. These researchers clean the upper part of the chip until they completely expose it. This is the little thing you see here. This a vector with X-ray. And what they do is they put it into this type of device at UV light for nail uh, nail paint and what they do they cut little layers until they can isolate the bytes where the root protection was impressive thank god we didn't have to do this this was in a different security level, but we wanted to extract the code. We needed to find a way to extract it. What did these people realize? When using JTAG protocol in order to unload the code, there was some sort of competition. On the one hand, it was the process that denied access, and on the other hand, it was the process that allowed you to download the code. They reduced JTAG JTAG protocol, in this case SWD to the minimum, to try to bypass this condition and they can read before access was denied. Of course, they had to implement this in a different microcontroller so that it was possible because this is real time conditions. The time window is very little, we have to be very fast. So the, the programming uh, development board. STM32 attacks another SMTM32. They reset the systems, they initialize the debug interface, they try to read. If it does, okay. If I can't, I try it again. And this way, we try to replicate the attack. We couldn't do it directly in the board, but we did chip off. We built an adaptation circuit which is really uh, clumsy. You see all the cables here connected. And we managed to extract, extract it to binary, we apply the exploit and we downloaded the binary and we could analyze it. Great. 
we found there were two ARM binaries that we had to analyze. Usually with ARM, I'm not going to get into detail, but when it's different architecture, you shouldn't be afraid of it. I would say it's simpler. There are um, records. There are instructions for different actions to access memory. And that's it. I'm not going to get into detail. But usually, when you apply reverse engineering, just using this program, it's going to paint this binary code in assembler, in this case is ARM, so you can study it and see what the program does. In IDA Pro, you upload an .exe file, elf, Linux's elf something, which is in a known format and Ida knows how to interpret it. The only thing we had was a giant binary and we had to give it to Ida. When Ida saw this, she cried because she doesn't know what to do with it. This is a binary file, what do I do with this? What could we tell her? We knew it was a binary file, ARM, and what else? Well, everything that's included in datasheet. What does it say? When a binary is launched, the code is loaded in this direction. Well, you have to tell Ada this. Where is the read-only memory? Where is the code? In this address. What's its size? Well, the whole size of it. Where is the RAM? We've already seen it in the datasheet. It's 0, zero 2000, whatever what size, what's stated in the data sheet. Once you include this information, Ida doesn't look at either because she doesn't know where's the entry point, where the code starts. How do we know where the code is uh, started to, uh, it's, when you start to execute the code? We go back to the data sheet and we see the interruption vector table. It explains what's going to happen when a series of interruptions take place. And well, particularly this reset interruption, which is when the code is going to be launched when there's a reset. So by working, we see that the second four byte group is the entry point. We tell this to Ida and she starts doing her work. Another trick, we look for memory addresses that point that area and we have more sites where theoretically there's code. And this way we can find more and more code. Another big problem we face in this type of scenario is that we cannot establish a difference between a something that depends on a library or a third party or what the programmer himself has written. We don't want to waste our time by studying third party libraries. And we used Bindiff. It's a tool and I had a pro supplement or complement that looks for a difference between two binary assemblers. This is used by people writing exploits. When there's a window patch, they compare the new one and the old one, the old DLL and the new one, and you can see where Microsoft has a patch. You see where the bug was. How do we use this? We use this for two things. First of all, the word to microcontrollers. I'm speaking very fast because I'm running out of time. We had to microcontroll it, so it was interesting to use that work in order to um, do ours. 
And second, we wanted to know what compiler the manufacturer had used to develop the product and which were the functions. In the first binary we had in IDA, we didn't know anything, we couldn't find anything. So, we checked in the internet, STM32 development environment, and we copied an example project using two chains that were more common but because we assumed that our developers were not going to use something very extraordinary they found in a dark place of the internet. They're going to use the same thing everybody uses. And this was the case. So we compiled an example project with the most famous one. We run it through this Bindiv tool and we guessed functions that we could expect here, the most common functions when programming. Little by little, we compiled more complex projects and then we applied the same process to Diaphora, which is another tool like Pindiv, but it doesn't work with Assembler, but with source code. How did we have source code? Because in IDA Pro, it comes with a plugin called X-Rays that allows you to obtain the source code. In this way you have different tools to compare and this way we recovered 70% of the code. In the past we need to study 100 megabytes of code and now it's just 30 megabytes so it's a time saving. What else did we do? to study this code, to see what they were doing. We used IDA Python. It's the script language in Python. There was something we saw in the datasheet, that this type of architecture, peripherals are mapped in the memory. This means that if you want to write in the serial port, the only thing you need to do is establish an instruction of loading or recovery to the address where the serious port is located. You always work with the memory. So knowing the look that the disassembled would have, we wrote a script that looked for this type of patterns. If it was STR, it was output, it was if it was LDR, it was input. And this way we could find in which section of our code, which section of our code was interacting with the serial port of any other peripheral. As you can imagine, this is very important. If you want to know about the communication with the other microcontroller, you need to study this area. And this was the static analysis. The next step was dynamic, in other words, debugging. The problem is that there were many processors here, connections were complicated. It was complicated. So, tricks we used. Three that I'm going to explain now. There are restrictions. Initially, you can do input-output because there are no peripherals, you cannot interact with peripherals. This is useful in order to study isolated functions. MMAP. This is a function that allows you to map a file into a, a memory address. For some strange reason, it allows me to say where I want to upload my code, but thanks to this we could map it to the memory address 0, 0800 whatever, the one we saw before. We have a pointer, function pointer. We call that function with the parameters that interested that, that we wanted. Source code copy. If we have the source code of a function, we copy it, we compile it and we see what it does. Simple. How can we compile this? 
Of course, we need CROSSIC compiling. We need to compile this to ARM. QEMU, it can emulate ARM, so we compile for ARM in our own PC. We debug with GDB, and that was it. Something else. We could emulate not just a function, but the whole microcontroller. And for that, there's a development environment called GNU MCU Eclipse, which has a plugin that allows you to do that. You can emulate a whole firmware. It supports many development boards. You can define the connections in your board. They've already been defined. We're not going to define ours because we lack the necessary knowledge in order to do that. So we decided to execute QMO that emulated the whole firmware and we used GDB in order to connect and monitor it. If you see here, the GDB, at the point at which it stops when you start it, is the interruption vector was mentioned before. It does allow us to monitor serial ports, which is a very good thing. So we had access to SWD, JTAG. We knew about our goal through reversing, static, dynamic offline, dynamic. And now it was time to find bugs. So we did some fuzzing and dynamic debugging. For that, we had our JTAG. We had a tool called OpenOCD and on the other hand we did fussing in the interfaces we had, which meant that we need to buy this device. We programmed it so that it worked with packages and at the same time we monitored it to see whether it was focusing on our target. This were all the connections and cables we had to use. The length of the cable matters because they offer resistance to it's a sensitive environment. But we can do things. What about exploiting? This is everything you already know. It's even simpler since there's no operation system, there are no protections. Techniques such as ASL are, which make it more difficult, are not applicable here. And there's an interesting difference, which is, since there's no memory management unit, when you read zero address in Windows, it crashes. If you read it in Linux, it crashes. And here it depends. In our case, since there's no, usually there's no MMU, in the datasheet we saw that in zero address there's a copy of the firmware, so if you read it, it doesn't crash, it returns your firmware, which is great. There was something similar with iPhone 3GS, I think, is what was one of the exploits they had for jailbreak. To organize a firmware, if we wanted to maintain access, it's quite simple. In the case of Flash, we had to concatenate the code. But you need access for your space for your variables. How? Where can we store our variables? We need to design the SRAM with a value we already know, then we execute it, we interact it, we move it, and we download RAM again. And the sections that contained our original value hadn't been used, so we, you can use it to store your valuables. Conclusions. Read the datasheet. 
they're very there's a lot of interesting information there in ST microelectronics says that our microcontrollers have the strongest re protection in the market however we acknowledge there are dishonest and possibly illegal ways of bypassing these protections. Assume that firmware is public, protect buses, not just with plastic, always encrypt, and physical access is game over or not. We can discuss this outside if you want. That's all. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>